Thank you so much for coming. I'm excited to be here <clears throat> um, at Data Council Austin to discuss leveling up your data lake with Delta and LakeFS. Uh, my name is Paul. I'm a developer advocate at uh, LakeFS. Uh, before that, I was a data engineer at several companies in uh, the New York area. Uh, I'm interested in <clears throat> democratizing big data um, for people to feel confident to use it um, for their personal interests. Unfortunately, my co-speaker, Adi, could not make it, but we will um, persevere nonetheless. So we're going to today discuss in a pretty quick little talk um, I have prepared on <clears throat> covering uh, what is a basic data lake, what it looks like, what it's good for, and then some improvements we can make to up uh, the level of our data lake game with uh, table formats and data version control. So we will start from the bottom and work our way up um, to the top. So a data lake is primarily two things. It is an object store and the objects being stored. Um, <clears throat> your main object stores are the main cloud provider's services like Amazon S3, Google Blob, and um, sorry, Azure Blob and Google Cloud Storage, as well as some um, interesting open source solutions like the now $1 billion worth um, valuated MinIO um, and a couple other options. <clears throat> and if you're just getting started with a data lake, you might have something like CSV files that um, every day you save under a date partition path. And with this basic architecture, you are <clears throat> in a pretty good spot to handle all of the use cases for data, like uh, business intelligence, machine learning, model development, and um, data intensive APIs or operational analytics. And the, uh, uh, the flexibility <clears throat> to do all of these, the fact that you can do all these different use cases speaks to the flexibility of object stores um, and sort of their strength. Um, they're pretty ubiquitously used um, from what I see and uh, people kind of take them for granted. So I think it's worth taking a couple minute interlude to um, <clears throat> remind ourselves of some of their features and strengths. So. Why, why use object storage for data, besides the fact that they are kind of meant to store data? But they're pretty awesome in terms of a number of um, categories, performance, cost, developer experience, and the fact that they can connect to pretty much every data tool that I've ever come across. And to give you some specifics in terms of performance, they will automatically scale to thousands of put and get requests per prefix. Um, the scaling happens like automatically behind the scenes and gives you almost like unlimited capacity. <clears throat> uh, besides for some notable um, times like the entire internet went down, when like S3 went down, they're pretty reliable and available, at least compared to anything you might self-host. Um, you will pay for two things when using an object store, the storage and the network costs. Um, and they are compared to the comparable um, block storage that you'll find in a database. They're pretty cost effective, about five to eight times cheaper, according to what I saw online and my personal experience. Um, no one has ever opened up their AWS bill and been outraged at their their S3 costs. Um, they have a pretty great developer experience. It's very easy to connect to them. There's no clunky database connection strings that have always um, caused me headaches. And whatever language you use, there's probably a mature client SDK to read and write data from them. Um, two newer features that uh, have come out in the S3 ecosystem in the last few years that uh, I'm happy to point out are um, Strong consistency, which means when you write an object, you're guaranteed for it to come back in a subsequent read. Very impressive for such a large scale distributed system. 
and uh, AWS Storage Lens, which gives you out of the box, just very nice usage um, graphs over time per bucket, per prefix. Uh, you don't have to set up this monitoring, monitoring yourself. You can catch if you're like, um, you know, some, some particular buckets storage is out of control, helps you catch it, comes automatically if you haven't checked it out. And they're much more, um, object stores have a lot more features than just being like Dropbox for developers. Um, you can set up data replication policies, my personal favorite event notifications, and um, you know, set up permissioning on, on, on the prefix level. Uh, there's, a lot, uh, there's a lot going on. And finally, <clears throat> whether you're using um, you know, Spark or Snowflake or Presto, Trino, Kafka, um, all these tools pretty much know how to speak the object store language. And uh, it serves as a nice sort of common layer of interoperability between these tools. So it's a little bit about object stores, why I think they're pretty great, why they are um, very widely used. And um, <clears throat> also the company I work for, like Fess, the logo just uh, appeared in the box, also knows how to work with object stores as we'll cover a bit later. So um, while object stores are great, they, um, they're pretty general purpose tools. And when using them for data, there are a number of um, you know, analytics specific improvements we can make to make them even better. And this is kind of because um, unlike in a database where the storage is very um, ob obfuscated to the end user, um, in object stores, it's you know right out in front. This has its pros and cons. Um, as the downside, you can find yourself managing kind of low-level file problems that maybe you shouldn't be dealing with. But on the pro side, we are open to customize um, how the object store works um, in certain ways, as we'll cover. So this is our basic. Um, data lake using an object store, let's uh, make some improvements to it. And the first and most obvious improvement we can make is to replace those uh, pesky CSV files that uh, no one really likes. So uh, what we can, a pretty simple improvement we can do is use uh, the Parquet file format, which is uh, it's open source, and it has a number of benefits like uh, being columnar, and the way it stores the data, it is highly compressible, and uh, it can support complex data types. <clears throat> and while this is great, unfortunately, however optimized uh, Parquet files can be, we are still, for the most part, dealing with um, collections of files or objects, which isn't uh, super fun. So <clears throat> what's missing? Uh, and we can borrow from the database world here, is the abstraction of a table. <clears throat> so to get to the next level, we can introduce uh, modern table formats to our data lake. And this provides the abstraction familiar from databases of a table. And um, this provides a number of benefits. So we can define schema on a collection of data uh, we can give the tables like human readable friendly names that uh, we can remember more easily than a, a path in an in object store. Uh, we can traverse the um, versions of the, um, we can traverse the, hi the history of updates of the table and, um, and, up and update the tables atomically. So if anyone's used an object store uh, without these table formats when you're writing data to under a certain prefix and then try to read the data, you might get a query error saying that like a file is being manipulated in the middle of the read. You might get strange inconsistent results because like half the file has been committed. And this solves that problem. These table formats, which the most popular implementations are Apache Hoodie, Apache Iceberg, and Delta Lake. Um, they keep a transaction log of all the files that are added and deleted from the table. 
as a, a piece of metadata that sits alongside the data itself. Um, this diagram is an example of like how Delta Lake works with the Delta log directory. And uh, in that is a transaction log that says, um, you know, parquet file one added, parquet two file removed. And when reading the table um, into a data frame, something like Spark, it will know to read that transaction log to see which files should be included. So uh, this greatly improves the manageability of our data lake, but we can further improve it by adding a new layer of abstraction of data version control. And here we see the new layer, um, which is provided by creating um, a repository, um, a data repository in which branches of, um, in which branches can be managed that contain the uh, table objects uh, from the table formats. So we get um, a lot of the same benefits from data version control. Uh, that we got from the table formats, but these can span um, at the level of an entire data lake across tables. So basically, within a data repository, we are able to perform certain Git-like operations and apply them to data sets in object storage. So we can um, take a commit of a branch, which saves a snapshot of um, all the tables at a specific point in time. We can create branches and add changes to one of them and then merge them back. And um, you know, uh, look at the history of these commits and, and traverse among them as needed. So two, the, the two most popular implementations of this are the LakeFS project, which I um, contribute to and work for, and there's another one called Project Nessie as well. So to make it a bit more clear how this works uh, and like when, when it's used, we can look at these, these operations. Um, we have a, you know, th these are all things, well, you can't do these, but um, they, it helps simplify um, managing the complex workflows that are done over modern data lakes. And to help uh, spell it out, here's some uh, examples of the command you'd run um, in Lake Control, our CLI tool, and what, uh, what it's useful for. So if you have a um, error that makes it into your production tables that maybe get exposed to external users or an important dashboard, um, you can use the revert command to um, send the data back to a previously known good snapshot of the data. <clears throat> and this lets you instantly recover from um, data, data quality issues while you maybe troubleshoot the, the root cause and fix it. Um, so you might have two data sets that you want to keep in sync. And this can be tricky if you're Definitely on the ob if you're operating on the object level, even on the table level, uh, it's hard to update two tables at the same time. What you can do with these Git-like workflows is create a branch, add changes to both tables on the <clears throat> new branch, and then perform a merge operation to atomically update the to atomically expose the data <clears throat> um, for both tables. Similarly. Uh, I'm sure everyone has made a copy of a table that they wanted to make a change on with their like initials or the date or some other manual marker. And this is a luxury you can do at smaller scales of data. And it's also not very manageable when you have a bunch of people trying to make changes. When you, <clears throat> with LakeFS, if you create a branch, you get an isolated um, development environment that contains a copy of all the data sets in your repository. And it does not duplicate the data uh, until you make a change. So uh, it's very cost effective and lets multiple people 
you know, change things simultaneously without worrying about how it affects others. And finally, um, this is a common machine learning use case. You want to run an experiment. You want it to be reproducible. Someone else a month later can run the same experiment and uh, confirm the results. But it's not easy to reproduce the state the data was at that exact time. <clears throat> if you take a commit, then you will have a generated commit ID you can reference to um, pull in the state of those tables at that time. So that is the main um, ways to level up your data lakes. If you're operating at the file level, you should um, not and consider uh, operating at the table and the repository level. So <clears throat> thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> if you want to check out more, uh, you can go to lakefs.io to read our documentation, check out our blog. We have a <clears throat> Slack community as well, which a um, uh, lot of helpful people. Uh, we have a playground environment in which you can try out um, using LakeFS over data sets. And um, thank you very much. Happy to answer any questions.